welcome. My name is Sam Rentschler, and walking with me this evening are Natalie, Natalie Quaid and Colin Williams. Three of us are students here at Spain High School, and tonight we have the distinct honor of hosting the annual Poetry Out Loud competition. Before we begin, we would like to ask you to please silence your phones as we would like you to focus on our contestants tonight. First, thank you for coming out this evening to support our, our student performers. Thank you also to the judges, teachers, and administrators who also have made this night possible. The winner of tonight's event will be given an opportunity to move ahead to compete at the state level and ultimately have a shot at winning thousands of dollars in scholarship. The National Poetry Out Loud competition uses a pyramid structure that begins at the classroom level. Winners advance to the school-wide competition, then to their state competition, and ultimately to the national finals. Tonight's contestants, who represent the best among their peers in their English classes, begin by selecting a poem from the Poetry Out Loud website. By memorizing the poem, paying attention to detail, and using vocal variety, the one who received the highest score advanced to tonight advanced to tonight's school-wide competition. Our school champion will advance to the state competition in March, and the win winner of the Michigan contest will head to the national finals, which will take place in April in Washington, D.C. The order of events this evening includes the recitation of 33 poems, an intermission, and an announcement of the top five, top five speakers. Then there will be a second poetry recitation by the top five. Finally, after the judges have heard the second poems of the top five and the scores are calculated, the final winner of the Poetry Out Loud for Celine High School 2015 will be announced. Our first six performers are waiting in the wings, so without further ado, let's get the show started. To begin, we will hear from Hannah Benedict, Victor Chen, Sierra Wallach, Leah Hine, Samantha Fitch, and Ashley Amigan. Hello, everybody. My name is Hannah Bendek, and I will be reciting The Ocean by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The ocean has its silent caves, deep, quiet, and alone. Though there be fury on the waves, beneath them there is none. The awful spirits of the deep hold their communion there, and there are those for whom we weep, the young, the bright, the fair. Calmly the wearied seamen rest beneath their own blue sea. The ocean solitudes are blessed, for there is purity. The earth has guilt, the earth has care, unquiet are its graves. But peaceful sleep is ever near beneath the dark blue waves. Good evening. My name is Victor Chen, and I will be reciting the poem, I am learning to abandon the world by Linda Paston. I am learning to abandon the world before it can abandon me. Already, I have given up the moon and snow, closing my shades against the claims of light. And the world has taken my father, my friends. I have given up melodic lines of hills, moving to a flat, tuneless landscape. And every night, I give my body up, limb by limb, working upwards across bone, towards the heart. But morning comes with small reprieves of coffee and birdsong. A tree outside the window, which was simply shadow moments ago, takes back its branches, twig by leafy twig. And as I take my body back, the sun lays its warm muzzle on my lap, as if to make amends. Long I stood, 
and looked on one as far as I could to where it fit and the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps a better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that passing there, had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden the black. Oh, I saved the first for another day. Yet knowing how way is on to way, I doubt if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, some more ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Behind, and I will be performing their bodies by David Wagner. That gaunt old man came first, his hair as white as your scour tables. Maybe you'll recollect him by the scars of steel mill burns on the back of his hands, on the nape of his neck, on his arms and sinewy legs. And her, by the enduring innocence of her face, as open to all of you in death as it would have been in life. She would memorize your names and ages and pastimes and hometowns, if she could. But she can't now, so remember her. They believed in doctors, listened to their advice, and followed it faithfully. You should treat them one last time as they would have treated you. They had been kind to others all their lives and believed in being useful. Remember, somewhere, their son is trying hard to believe that you'll learn as much as possible from them, as he did, and will do your best to learn politely and truly. They gave away the gift of those useful bodies against his wish. They had their own ways of doing everything, always. If you are not certain which ones are theirs, be gentle to everybody. and I will be reciting On Quitting by Edgar Albert Guest. How much grit do you think you've got? Can you quit a thing that you like a lot? You may talk of pluck. It's an easy word. And wherever you go is often heard. But can you tell to a jot or guess just how much courage you now possess? You may stand in trouble and keep your grit. But have you tackled self-discipline? Have you ever issued commands to you to quit the things that you like to do. And then, when tempted and sorely swayed, those rigid orders have you obeyed? Don't boast of your grit till you've tried it out. You are great to men of your courage stout. For well, excuse me enough to attain a grit, in the face of the fight, there's a chance to win. But the sort of grit that is good to own is the stuff you need when you're all alone. How much grit do you think you've got? Can you turn from joys that you like a lot? Have you ever tested yourself to know how far with yourself your will can go? If you want to know if you have grit, just pick out a joy that you like and quit. It's a bully sport. It's open fight. It'll keep you busy both day and night, for the toughest kind of game you'll find is to make your body obey your mind, and you'll never know what is meant by grit unless there's something you've tried to quit. Ashley and Megan, I'm a fool to love you by Cornelius E. D. Some folks will tell you the blues is a woman, some type of supernatural creature. My mother would tell you, if she could, a 
about her life, my father. A strange, sometimes cruel gentleman. She will tell you about the choices a young black woman faces. Is falling in love with some man or deal with the devil? In new terms, the time we use when we don't want new ones to get in the way, when we need to talk straight. My mother chooses my father after choosing a man who was, as we sing it, of no account. This man made my father look good. That's how bad it was. He made my father seem like an island in the middle of a stormy sea. He made my father look like a rock. And it's the blues the moment you realize you exist in a stacked deck. You look in the mirror at the young face, the face my sister carries, and you know it's the only language you've got. Does this create a hurt that whispers, how are you going to do? It's the blues the moment you shrug your shoulders and agree a girl without money is nothing, dust, to be pushed around by any old breeze. Compared to this, my father seems briefly to be a fire. This is the way the blues works at sorry wonders. Makes trouble look like a feather bed. Makes the wrong man's kisses a healing. Spider. 
I marked where a promontory that stood isolated. Marked how to explore the vacant vast surrounding. It launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself. Ever unreeling that, ever tirelessly speeding that. And you, oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them. Till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hoist, till the gossamer thread you fling, catch someone, oh my soul. My name is Andy Earl, and the poem I'll be reciting tonight is The Way It Sometimes Is by Henry Tate. At times, it is like watching a face you have just met, trying to decide who reminds you of. No, sure, whom you ever hated or loved. But yes, somebody, somebody. You watch the face as it turns and nods, showing you at certain angles curve in the lips, or the lift of the eyebrow that is exactly right. And still the face eludes you. Now the face is talking, and you hear a sound in the voice, the accent on certain words, yes, a phrase you barely recall sitting outside by a pool or a campfire, remarking a peculiar recurring expression. Two syllables, wasn't it? Zorna, Bathroom, Shaw Cross. What the hell kind of word is Shaw Cross? <laughs> a name, not the right one. A couple of syllables that could possibly be a little like something you may have once heard. So you talk drifts, and you drift, sneaking glances, pounding your brain. Days later, a face occurs to you. And yes, there is a resemblance. That odd word, though, or phrase, is gone. It must have been somebody else. Yes, it's like that at times. Something is, maybe. And there are days when you can almost say what is. Thank you. My name is Ayla Tai, and I'll be reciting Lines Written in Early Spring by William Wordsworth. I heard a thousand blended notes swell in the crow vibrantly. I sate recline in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind. To her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran, and much it Briefed my heart to think what man has made of man. Through primrose tufts in that green bower, the periwinkle trailed its wreaths, and tis my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. The birds around me hop and play, their thoughts I cannot measure, but the least motion which they made, it seemed a thrill of pleasure. The budding twigs spread out their, their fans to catch the breezy air. And I must think, do all I can, that there was pleasure there. If this belief from heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? and I will be reciting Let It Be Forgotten by Sarah Tinsdale. Let it be forgotten, like a flower is forgotten, forgotten as a fire that once was singing gold. 
Let it be forgotten forever and ever. Time is a kind friend. He will make us old. If anyone asks, say it was forgotten long and long ago, as a flower, as a fire, as a hushing footfall in a long forgotten snow. It's important for you to know how the contestants will be judged this evening. There are seven points to focus on, which the, ju which the judge will focus on. <laughs> Physical presence, which includes posture, use of eye contact, and body language. Voice and articulation, this category is to evaluate the auditory nature of the recitation, volume, speed, use of voice inflection, and proper pronunciation. Appropriate, appropriateness of dr dramatization. Rec oh, excuse me. Recitation is about conveying a poem's sense of primary, primarily with one's voice. In this way, recitation is closer to the art of oral interpretation than theatrical performance. Level of difficulty. This category is to evaluate the comparative difficulty of the poem which is the result of several factors, specifically content, language, and length. Every poem is a different combination of content, language, and length, and the judges should score accordingly, accordingly excuse me, based on their own independent evaluation of each poem. Evidence of understanding. This category is to evaluate whether the performer exhibits an understanding of the poem in his or, or her recitation. This category is to evaluate oh, overall performance. This category is to evaluate the overall success of the recitation, taking into account the above. <coughs> the above criteria, the judges will be will use this score to measure how impressed they are, they were by the recitation and whether the recitation has honored the poem. And finally, accuracy. This is the last part of the judging equation. A separate accuracy judge will mark missed or incorrect words during the recitation with small deductions for each. If the contestant needs to be prompted, points also will be subtracted from the accuracy score. Eight points will be added to the competitor score for a perfect recitation. Our next six performers are Kaylee Griffin, Matt Lau, Dominic Bertoya, Ryan Klumpner, Kiana Kinn, and Connor Pettis. Hello, my name is Kaylee Griffin, and I will be reciting The Donkey by G.K. Chesterton. When fishes flew and forests walked, and figs grew upon thorns, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like hair and wings, the devil was walking parody on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am done. I keep my secrets still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour, and sweet. There was a shout about my ears, and palms before my feet. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Lau, and I will be reciting The Ocean by Nathaniel Hardgrove. The ocean has its silent caves, deep, quiet, and alone. Though there be fury on the waves, beneath them there is none. The awful spirits of the deep hold their communion there. 
And there are those for whom we weep, the young, the bright, the fair. Calmly the weary seamen rest beneath their own blue sea. The ocean solitudes are blessed, for there is purity. The earth has guilt, the earth has care. Unquiet are its graves. Peaceful sleep is ever there beneath the dark blue waves. Hello, my name is Dominic Pretoria, and I will be performing Experience Ira Waldo Emerson. The lords of life, the lords of life, I saw them pass in their own guise, like and unlike, portly and grim, use and surprise, succession swift and spectral wrong, temperament without a tongue, and the inventor of the game, omnipresent without aim. Some to see, some to be guessed, they marched from east to west. Little man, least of all, among the legs of his guardians tall, walked, al walked along with a puzzled look. Him by the hand dear nature took, dearest nature, strong and kind, whispered, darling, never mind. Tomorrow, they will wear another face. The founder that. These are thy race. Hi, I'm Ryan Klempner, and I'll be performing The Arrow in the Song by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where, for so swiftly it flew, the sight could not follow it in its flight. I breathed the song into the air, it fell to earth, I knew not where, for who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Long, long afterward, in an oak, I found the arrow still unbroke, and the song, from beginning to end, I found again in the heart of a friend. My name is Keanu Quinn, and I will be reciting The Legend by Garrett Conklin. In Chicago, it is snowing softly, and a man has just done his wash for me. He steps into the twilight of early evening, carrying a wrinkled shopping bag full of newly folded clothes, and, for a moment, enjoys the feel of warm laundry and crinkled paper, flannel-like, against his gloveless hand. There's a reverent glow on his face, a triangle of orange in the hollow of his cheek as the last flash of sunset blazes the storefronts and lit windows of the street. He is Asian, Thai, or Vietnamese, and very skinny, dressed as one of the four in ruffled suit pants and a plaid mackinac, dingy and too large. He negotiates the slick of ice on the sidewalk by his car, opens the fair lane's back door, leans to place the laundry in, and turns for an instant toward the flurry of footsteps and cries of pedestrians as a boy. That's all he was. Bats from the corner package store, shooting a pistol, firing it once at the dumbfounded man who falls forward, grabbing at his chest. A few sounds escape from his mouth, a babbling no one understands as people surround him, bewildered at his speech. The noises he makes are nothing to them. The boy has gone, lost in the light array of foot traffic, dappling the snow with fresh prints. Tonight, I read about Descartes' grand courage to doubt everything except his own reality's existence, and I feel so 
distinct from the wounded man lying on the concrete. I am ashamed. Let the night sky cover him as he dies. Let the weaver girl cross the bridge of heaven and take up his cold hands. and I'll be uh, reciting The Conqueror Worm by Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> Lo, tis a gala night, within the lonesome latter years, an angel, throng will wing the dight, it veils and drowned in tears, sits in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra breathes vividly the music of the speeders. Mimes, in the form of God on high, mutter and mumble low, and hither into their flood. Mere Puppets they who come and go at bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings, invisible woe. That motley drama, oh, it shall not be forgotten. With its shadow, chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not, through a circle that ever returneth into the self same spot, and much of madness, and more of sin, and horror the soul of the plot. But see, amid the mimic rout, a crawling shape intrude, a blood red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes with mortal pangs, the minds become its food, and seraphs sob and vermin bang in human gore and view. Out, out are the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pale, comes down with the rush of a storm. Will the angels, all pallid and wane, uprising, up, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy man, and its hero, the conqueror worm? Let's have money. Our winner tonight will take home a prize of one hundred dollars. Each winner at the state level will receive two hundred dollars and an all expenses paid trip with an adult chaperone to Washington, D.C. to compete for the national championship. The state winner's school will receive a five hundred dollar stipend for the pur purchase of poetry books. Our next few contestants are Sarah Rose. Megan Foley, Melissa Dawson, Juliana Medushi, Sarah Foley, and Anna Lachard. Hi, my name is Sarah Rose, and I will be reciting Cartoon and Physics Part 1 by Nick Flynn. Children under, say, 10. She didn't know that the universe is ever expanding. Galaxies swallowed by galaxies, whole solar systems collapsing. All of it acted out in silence. At 10, we are still learning the rules of cartoon animation. That if a man throws a door on a rock, only he can pass through it. Anyone else who tries to crash into the rock. 10 year olds should stick with burning houses, car wrecks, ships going down, earthbound, tangible disasters, arenas where they can be heroes. You can run back into a burning house. Sinking ships have lifeboats. The trucks will come with their ladders. If you jump, you will be saved. A child places her hand on the roof of a school bus. She knows the exact spot it will fit to, at which point the bridge will give, who will swim to safety, and who will be pulled under by sharks. She will learn that if a man jumps off the cliff, he will not fall until he notices his mistake. Hi, my name is Megan Foley, and I will be reciting The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tenzin. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all the valley of death, wrote the 600. For the Light Brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death, wrote the 600. 
Or would they like the gate? Was there a man to speak? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them. Cannon to the left of them. Cannon in front of them. Volleyed in thunder. Stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well. Into the jaw of death. Into the mouth of hell. Rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabers bears. Flashed as they towed in the air. Sabered the gunners there. They charged an army. All the world wondered. Plunged into the battered smoke. Right through the line they broke. Kolsak and Russian reared from the straggy stroke. Shattered and shundered. Then they rode back. But not, not six hundred. Cannon to the right of them. Cannon to the left of them. Cannon behind them. Volleyed and thunder. Stormed at with shot and shell. While the horse and the hero fell. They had fought so well. Came through the jaw of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of the six hundred. Oh, when can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made! All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made, honor the light brigade, noble six hundred. Dawson, and I'll be reciting fairy tale logic by A.E. Stallings. Fairy tales are full of impossible tasks. Gather the chin hairs of a man eating goat, or cross a sulfuric lake in a leaky boat. Select a prince from a row of identical masks. Tiptoe up to the dragon where it basks, and snatch its bone, count dust specks, moat by moat, or learn the phone directory by rote. It's always impossible what someone asks. You have to fight magic with magic. You have to believe that you have something impossible up your sleeve. The language of snakes, perhaps an invisible cloak. The army of ants at your back, or a lethal joke. The will to do whatever must be done. Marry a monster, hand over your firstborn son. I'm Juliana, and I'll be reciting The Woman at Washington Zoo by Randall Gerald. The saris go by me from the embassies, caught from the moon, caught from another planet. They look back at the leopard like the leopard. And I, this print of mine that has kept its color alive through so many cleanings, this dull, null, navy, I wear to work, and wear for work, and so to my bed, so to my grave, with no complaints, no comment. Neither for my chief, the deputy chief assistant, nor his chief. Only I complain. This serviceable body that no sunlight guides, no hand suffuses, but dome shadow, withering among columns, wavy beneath mountains, small, far off, shining in the eyes of the animals, these beings trapped, as I am trapped, but not themselves, the trap. Aging but without knowledge of their age, kept safe here, knowing not of death, for death. O oh, bars of my own body, open, open! The world goes by my cage and never sees me, and there come not to me, as come to these, the wild beasts, sparrows pecking at the llama's brain, pigeons settling on the bear's bread, buzzards, Tearing the meat the flies have clouded. Vulture, when you come to me, when you come, when you come for the when you come for the white foxes. When you come for the white rats, the white, the foxes left. Take off the red helmet of your head, the black wings that have shadowed me, 
and step to me as man. The wild brother. At whose feet the white wolf spawn. To whose to whose hand the power of the great lioness stops purring. You know what I am. Change me. Change me. Hi, I'm Sarah Foley, and I will be reciting Dreamers by Cypress Essen. Soldiers are citizens of dust, gray land, drawing no dividend from time to tomorrow. In the great hour of destiny they stand, each with his own feuds and jealousies and sorrows. Soldiers are sworn to action. They must win some flaming, fatal climax with their lives. Soldiers are dreamers. When the guns begin, they think of clean beds, firelit homes, and wives. I see them in foul dugouts, gnawed by rats, and in ruined trenches, lashed with rain. Dreaming of things they did with balls and bats and mocked by hopelessness, longing to regain bank holidays, picture shows, and spats, and going to the office in the train. Thank you. Hello, I'm Anna Lashard, and I am reciting Fairy Tale Logic by A.E. Stalin. Fairy tales are full of impossible tasks. Gather the chin hairs of a man-eating goat, or cross a superb lake in a leaky boat. Select the prince from a row of identical masks, tiptoe up to the dragon where it basks, and snatch its bone, count dust specks, moat by moat, or learn the phone directory by rope. Always it's impossible what someone asks. You have to fight magic with magic. You have to believe that you have something impossible up your sleeve. The language of snakes, perhaps an invisible cloak, an army of ants at your beck, or a lethal joke. The will to do whatever must be done. Marry a monster. Hand over your firstborn son. Thank you. $50,000 in scholarship prizes and school stipends at the national finals, including $20,000 for the Poetry Out Loud national champion and $10,000 and $5,000 respectively for the second and third finalists. The remaining nine finalists each receive $1,000 and the schools of the top 12 finalists each will, will, will receive $500 for the purchase of poetry books. In total, Poetry Out Loud will award, award more than $100,000 at state and national level contests. Next, we will hear from Marissa Conlin, Joycelyn Inch, Mackenzie Green, Nay Schaefer, and Robbie Amore. Sometimes, I say I'm going to meet my sister at the cafe, even though I have no sister, just because it's such a beautiful thing to say. I've always thought so, ever since I read a novel in which two sisters were constantly meeting in cafes. Today, for example, I walk alone on the wet sidewalk, wearing my rain boots, expecting someone might ask where I was headed. I bought a ski notepad and a watch battery. The story window swabs up. Rain in April is a kind of promise, and it costs nothing. I brought a bag of books to the cafe and ordered tea. I like a place that's lit by lamps. I like a place where you can hear people talk about small things. 
like the difference between Azul and Servant and the price of tulips. It's going down. I watched someone who could be my sister walk in, shaking the rain from her hair. I thought, even now, florists are selling their coolers with tulips. Five dollars a bundle. All over the city, there are sisters. Any one of them could be mine. I'm Jocelyn Inge, and I will be reciting One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent. To be lost as their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names, and where was you meant to travel? None of these things will bring disaster. I lost my mother's keys, and look, my last, or next to last, of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and faster, some realms I owned. Two rivers, a continent, I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident. The art of losing is not too hard to master. Even though it may look like, write it, a disaster. I'm Mackenzie Green, and I'm going to be reciting Silence by Thomas Hood. There is a silence where hath been no sound. There is a silence where no sound may be. In the cold grave, in the deep, deep sea, or in the wide desert where no life is found, which hath been mute and still must be profound. No voice is hushed, no life treads silently, but clouds and cloudy shadows wander free, that never spoke over the ideal ground. But in green ruins, in the desolate walls of antique palaces where man hath been, though the dun fox or wild hyena calls, and owls that put continually between, shrieks the echo and the low winds moan. There the true science is, self-conscious and alone. Good evening, my name is Nia Schaefer, and I will be reciting In the Desert by Stephen Crane. In the desert, I saw a creature, naked, bestial, who, squatting upon the ground, held his heart in his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good? It is bitter. Bitter, he answered. But I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. My name is Ravi Amore, and I'll be performing Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet, the menace of the years 
finds and shall find thee, unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you. The Arts Endowment and the Poetry Foundation implemented a pilot program in Washington, D.C. and the Chicago area schools in 2005. Starting with the 2005-2006 school year, Poetry Out Loud, Out Loud has presented a national competition, reaching high school students in every state and the District of Columbia. In 2008, the U.S. Virgin Isles joined the national competition. Last year, more than 365,000 students competed. Anita Norman, a student from Arlington, Tennessee, won at last year's national competition and recited Let the Light Enter by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper in the finals. Our final poems will be recited now. Let's hear from our final uh, contestants. Dominic Dorsett, Lexi Morris, Phil Zemba, Matt Cosivelli, and Carl Tye. Now in Dorset, and I'll be reciting Golden Retrievals by Mark Beauty. Catch. Balls and sticks. Capture my attention. Seconds at a time. Catch? I don't think so. Funny. Tell me, please. A squirrel loose. Oh, joy. Actually scared. Sniff the wind. Then, I'm off again. Muck, pond, ditch. Resident walk, many throwing me dead thick. And you? Either you're sunk in the past. Half hour walk. Thinking of what you can never bring back. Or else you're off in some fog concerning tomorrow? Is that what you call it? My work to ensnare a time's warp and whoop! Retrieving my haze headed friend, you, this shining bark. A Zen master's bronzy gong calls you here entirely. Now, bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. Across my soul with those same boots of lead again. Then space began to toll. <coughs> as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear, and I in silence, some strange race wrecked, solitary here. And then a plank in reason broke. And I dropped down and down and hit a world at every plunge and finished, knowing then. Hello, everybody. My name is Philip Zemba, and I'll be reciting Conversation by I. We smile at each other, and I lean back against the wicker couch. How does it feel to be dead, I say? You touch my knees with your blue fingers, and when you open your mouth, a ball of yellow light falls to the floor and burns a hole through it. Don't tell me, I say. I don't want to hear. Did you ever, you start, wear a certain kind of silk dress and 
just by accident so inconsequential that you barely notice it? Your fingers graze that thrust, and you hear the sound of a knife cutting paper, and you see it too, and you realize how this image is simply the extension of another image, and that your whole life is just a chain of words that will one day snap. Words you say, like young girls in a circle holding hands and beginning to rise heavenward in their confirmation dresses, like, like white helium balloons, the wreaths of flowers on their heads beginning to spin. And above all that, that's where I'm floating. Only it's ten times clearer. It's ten times more horrible. Could anyone alive survive it? And tonight I will be reciting Life by Edith Wharton. Life, like a marble block, is given to all, a blank, inchoate mass of years and days, once one with art and chisel swift essays. Some shape or strength or symmetry to call, one shatters in its bits to mend a wall, one in a crafter hand the chisel lays, and one to wake the mirth in lesbian's gaze. Carves their pace and toys fantastical. But well, least is he who, with enchanted eyes, filled with high hopes of fair shapes to be, muses with God he shall immortalize in the proud parian's perpetuity, till the twilight warns him from punctual skies that in the night cometh wherein none shall see. Hello, my name is Carl Tai, and before the intermission tonight, I will be reciting On Quitting by Edgar Albert Guest. How much grit do you think you've got? Can you quit a thing that you like a lot? You may talk of bluffhead. It's an easy word, and where you go, it is often heard. But can you tell to a jot or guess just how much courage you now possess? You may stand in trouble and keep your grin. What have you tackled? Self-discipline? Have you ever issued commands to you to quit the things that you like to do, and then, when tempted and sorely swayed, those rigid orders have you obeyed? Don't boast of your grit till you've tried it out, nor pray to men of your courage stout. For it's easy enough to retain a grin. In the face of a fight, there's a chance to win. But the sort of grit that is good to own is the stuff you need when you're all alone. How much grit do you think you've got? Can you turn from joys that you like a lot? Have you ever tested yourself to know how far with yourself your will can go? If you want to know if you have grit, just pick out a joy that you like and quit. It's bully sport and it is open fight. It will keep you busy both day and night. For the toughest kind of a game you'll find is to make your body obey your mind. And you never know what is meant by grit unless there's something you've tried to quit. Thank you.
I enjoy how the speakers have the ability to make the poems come to life, not only by communicating the message, but also by through the rhythms and patterns in the poetry. <clears throat> I'm a little curious as to the motivation behind each performer picking their particular poem. But I'm guessing that what the audience is most interested in is, at this point, is who our top five contestants are. So let's reveal them. Okay, the top five speakers of this e evening are Hallie Fox, Kaylee Griffith, B. Thea Gibbons, Ashley Megan, and Dominic Dorsett. make their way to the stage, and the judges prepare, prepare for the final five poems. We would like to present another living type of poetry here at Celine High School, our choir. Here to sing is Celine High School's Ten Tones. Good evening. The Ten Tones rehearse once a week, and we are currently preparing our own contest pieces. We will perform this evening's tunes in a few weeks at Solo and Ensemble Festival. We will be judged on a variety of musical categories. Like the performers tonight, our goal is also to bring poetry and text to life. Our first piece tonight is a French chanson from the 1500s called Je ne vous dirai by Pierre Souton, the poetic translation of this sometimes nonsensical madrigal is as follows. La la la, do I care, don't I care, do I care to say it? La la la, tell me that I may, or la la la, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> There is a poor man in our village, jealous of his wife is he. He is jealous for good reason, for he is a sight to see. La, 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 do I dare, don't I dare, do I dare to say it? La, 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 tell me that I may, or la, 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 I'll say it anyway. If to market she should venture, he would always go along. Never from her side to wonder, then he sure shall do no wrong. La, 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 do I dare, don't I dare, do I dare to say it? La, 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 tell me that I may, or la, 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 I'll say it anyway. understanding of it. You have to figure out what it means and how are you going to present it to your audience. 
It also becomes more personal to you, and you appreciate something new about it with each recitation. Another student said, Reading words is great, but they are also meant to be spoken. The way that you say things is so important, and with poetry, which is meant to convey emotions and tell stories, it's crucial. There are poems I didn't get at all before Poetry Out Loud that I now love. Someone else commented, I entered because I am a competitive speaker. Next year, I will enter because I love poetry. Now let's sit back and listen to the final five poems. I'm Kaylee Griffith, and I'll be reciting Let the Light Enter by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. The Dying Words of Goethe. Light, more light, the shadows deepen, and my life is ebbing low. Throw windows widely open, light, more light, before I go, softly let the balmy sunshine play around my dying bed. And ere the dimly lighted valley, I, with lonely feet, must tread. Light, more light, for death is weaving. Death is weaving shadows round my waning sight. And I fain would gaze upon him in the earthly light. Not for greater gifts of genius, not for thoughts more grandly bright. All the dying poet whispers is a prayer for light, more light. Heeds he not the gathered laurels slowly fading from his sight? All the poet's aspirations center in that prayer. For light, gracious Savior, when life's daydreams melt and vanish from the sight, may our dim and long vision then be blessed with light, more light. Thank you. My name is Thea Gibbons, and I will be reciting The Larger by Joni Mikowski. I don't know how it happened, but I fell, and I was immense. One dislocated arm wedged between two buildings. I felt some ribs had broken, perhaps a broken neck too. I couldn't speak. My dress caught, bunched about my thighs, and where my glasses shattered, there had spread something like a sea coast, or maybe it was a port. Where my hair tangled with power lines, I felt a hot puddle of blood. I must have passed out, but when I woke, a crew of about 50 was building a winding stairway beside my breast and buttressing a platform on my sternum. I heard, as through cotton, the noise of hammers, circular saws, laughter, and some radio droning songs about love. At the corner of one eye, could open one eye a bit, I saw my pocketbook, its contents scattered, my lipstick's toppled silo glinting out of reach. And then, waving a tiny flashlight, a man entered my ear. 
I felt his boots slosh in the blood trickling there. He never came out. So, some went looking. Flares, dogs, dynamite even. They burst my middle ear and, and found my skull. Its cavern crammed with dark matter, like a cross between a fungus and a cloud. They never found his body, though. And they never found, or tried to find, an explanation. I think, for me, they didn't seem to need one. Even now, my legs subdue that dangerous sea, the water bright enough to cut the skin. Where a lighthouse, perched on the tip of my great toe, each eight seconds rolls out a flawless pearl across the wave. It keeps most ships from wrecking against my feet. On clear days, people stand beside the light. They watch the waves move heads slip up and down and scan the landmark on the facing shore. My name is Ashley Megan. The bones of my father lie at Lloyd Shine. There are no dry bones here in this valley. The skull of my father grins at the Mississippi moon from the bottom of the Tallahatchie. The bones of my father are buried in the mud of these creeks and brooks that twist and flow their secrets to the sea. But the wind sings to me, here the sun speaks to me of the dry bones of my father. There are no dry bones in the northern valleys, in the Harlem alleys, young black men with me spent mud on the stoops of the tenements and dream of the dry bones of my father. And young white long hairs who flee their homes and bend their minds and sing their songs of brotherhood and no more words are searching for my father's bones. There are no dry bones here. We hide from the sun. No more do we take the long straight strides. Our steps have been shaped by the cages that kept us. We like sideways, like grubs across the sand. We perch on green lilies. We search beneath white rocks. There are no dry bones here. The skull of my father grins at the Mississippi moon from the bottom of the Tallahatchie. Hi, my name is Dominic Dorsett, and I'm going to be reciting Piano by D.H. Lawrence. Softly, in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years until I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small, poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and the hymns in the cozy parlor, the tinkling piano, our guide. So now it is vain that the singer bursts into clamor, and with the great black piano, a posse at nada, the glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast. Down in the flood of remembrance, I weep like a child for the past. My name is Hallie Fox, and I'll be reciting Larkinesque by Michael Ryan. Reading in the paper a summary of a five-year psychological study that shows 
that those perceived as most beautiful are treated differently. I think they could have just asked me, remembering a kind of pudgy kid in late puberty, the bloody noses and wisecracks because I wore glasses. Though we all know by now how awful it is for the busty starlet no one takes seriously. The loveliest woman I've lunched with, lamenting the opacity of the body. They can never trust a man's interest, even when he seems not just out for sex. Eyes focus on me above rim of wine glass. And who would want to live like this? And what does beauty do to a man? Don Juan, Casanova, Lord Byron. Those fiery eyes and steel jawlines confront a furnace of self-loathing. All those breathless women rushing to him while hubby's at the office or ball game, primed to be consumed by his beauty while he stands next to him, watching. So maybe the looks were dealt our best. It's only common sense that happiness depends on some bearable deprivation or defect. And who knows what conflicts great beauty could have caused, what cruelties one might have experienced from those now friends, what unmanageable possibilities smiling at every small turn. So if I get up to draw a tumbler of ordinary tap water and think, what if this were nectar dripping from delicious burning fingers? Will all I've missed not be senseless? No. Of course not. It won't. Well, we are at the end. And while the final scores are being calculated, once again, we will hear from Selena High School's Ten Tones. Our second piece tonight is Matthew Harris's modern setting of a William Shakespeare poem, It Was a Lover and His Last. It reads as, with a hey and a ho, and a hey nanny no. With a hey and a ho, and a hey nanny no. <laughs> it was a lover and his lass, that o'er the green corn field did pass, springtime. The only pretty ringtime, springtime, springtime, the only pretty ringtime. Between the acres of the rye, these pretty country folks would lie. And therefore, take the present time, for love is crowned with thy prime, or the prime. Uh, with a hey and a ho, hey nanny no.
take a moment to thank everyone that was involved in making this competition possible. First, thank you to our judges, beloved and retired English teacher, Ms. Mary Converse, Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Steve Latch, Eastern Michigan University Professor of Applied Drama and Theater for the Young, Ms. Christine Tanner, and our very own high school principal, Ms. Julie Helberg. and accuracy judge, English teachers, Ms. Jen Denson, and Mr. Jamie Volrath, and Mr. Bill Elliott. Thank you to all of the English departments, especially Ms. Caroline Keppel and Ms. Shirley Vedema for coordinating, organizing, and planning the entire SHS Poetry Out Loud competition. To Mrs. Horowitz, Ms. Clark, and Ms. Fink, for corralling and managing the student contestants before and during the competition tonight. To Ms. Kelly Tressler and Ms. Kristen Garnerowski for managing our front, our front door, and to Ms. Ann O'Harris for creating and managing our electronic store collecting, score collecting and tally. -oop. Our appreciation is also extended to Mr. Mike Hill, for the lovely program and for <laughs> photographing this, the events. To Mr. Nathan Bush, Bush's video production students for reporting this competition for antiquity, and to Ms. Sarah Price and the Celine Tentones for their musical performances. Without the tech staff, the students, and the audience, there would not be much of a production at all. So thank you for your support and encouragement. And now, let's find out the champion of tonight's competition. A drum, drum roll would be a pretty good one. Thank you. 